Okay, hello again. This uh, video is your introduction to Mary Pfeiffer and the first part of her book, The Middle of Everywhere, uh, which was published in 2002. Uh, in this video, I'll be sort of headlining the things that you're going to be reading about or you've already started reading about, giving you a little bit of a uh, background to Pfeiffer and what it is that she does. Uh, as well as uh, explain the term refugee in its legal status a little bit more and give you some information as you finish up the your reading assignment for this week and work towards your, your reading response. Um, so the first thing I want to just draw your attention to is uh, the link to the handout, or I'm sorry, the handbook, that is on your Blackboard site. Now it's the UNHCR uh, Handbook for uh, Procedures and Criteria for Determining Refugee Status. It's a very detailed uh, discussion of the provisions and criteria that have historically since the early 1950s been put into place to determine refugee status throughout the globe. And it's very detailed, it's very uh, much a guiding legal document, so it has very spelled out scenarios of what it is that a, a refugee is and can be in different places and at different times. Uh, it's certainly not something I want you to read through completely. However, as I mentioned in the email over the weekend, if you're going to look at anything, look at the, the introduction and the opening sections on uh, the criteria and how exactly uh, they've changed and what it means to define certain terms like uh, religion and nationality as well as other terms like in danger and all of these, these sort of qualifiers. But what I want to point you towards is a couple of just basic areas that are going to help us to understand what it is uh, that refugees have specifically uh, that determine their difference from other immigrants and, and migrants uh, in the grand scheme of things. And so if you open the document and you, you scroll down into, you'll see first the, the uh, yellow cover and then some more title pages. But if you look at the contents, the table of contents here, you'll see uh, the foreword number one, but then uh, the opening section, the introduction, which is broken down uh, in parts A through G. Uh, this tells you the um, sort of historical timeline, how this was built. And we're looking at, you know, number one, the, the uh, second decade in the 20th century as really the, the first inklings of determining uh, a specific refugee status and really getting steam after the Second World War closes out. And we can uh, make guesses as to why, and, and, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more as we, we discuss this. But if you look through that, even just browse through those uh, A through G uh, provisions and the development of those pr provisions, it might help you gather an understanding for uh, how this definition is built. And you'll really, if you don't understand anything else, you'll understand that, that it's not a, a black and white definition of what it is that a refugee uh, refers to. Uh, if you want to check out one particular place where this all comes together, I would suggest scrolling down to page number 10, which is actually in, in part one, chapter one, uh, which is called the Criteria for the Determination of Refugee Status. And you'll see there under the general principles 28, 29, 30, and 31, you'll begin to see what it is the more conventional, more updated version of how uh, the globe, the United Nations in particular, defines a refugee. And if you go under the definitions, which begin on page 10, you can look down to uh, point 34 there, and you finally have um, a much more um, explicit, though not you know, uh, a catch-all term for what it is that we uh, 
we know nowadays built on, on some historical precedent. And if you look, point 34 there on page 10 says, uh, according to Article 1A2 of the 1951 Convention, the term refugee shall apply to any person who, and then it quotes, as a result of events occurring before 1st of January 1951, and owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality, and is unable or, owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country, or who, not having a nationality and being outside of the country or his former habitual residence, as a result of such events, is unable or, owing to such fear, is unwilling to return to it. Okay, and then as it says, the general definition is discussed in detail below, and they do mean in detail. They go into all of these phrases and terminologies in order to more explicitly define what each of those things mean. Habitual residence, uh, events occurring before, all of these things are largely laid out for us or any particular person who seeks out this this definition uh, below. And we're not going to be digging into that so much as just to say that the refugee status indicates something specific other than just leaving one's country. Uh, and in fact, I want to just make sure we know that when we move on to other uh, definitions later, like immigrant and migrant and asylum seeker, all of these things. So. Pfeiffer, in her book, has chosen to look specifically at refugees, the refugee uh, identity, and even more so, as we get a little further into discussion, she's chosen to look at it particularly in regards to uh, her community, Lincoln, Nebraska, which is uh, where she is, uh, resides and has taught and has practiced as a clinical psychologist for many years. So the title of her book uh, it, it sometimes has a couple of different subtitles, All the World's Refugee, Refugees Come to Our Town. Uh, she's be, being very specific in terms of the locality, you know, making this a global issue, certainly, and and relating it or dissecting it or, or analyzing it in a very local and communal way. And this is why this book is, is, is uh, so complex. It's very much a, a study of the world's refugee situation, but she goes about doing it in an anecdotal and sort of personal history type of way, all while using this, this notion of what she terms uh, the cultural broker, somebody who works to help these refugees acclimate and sort of assimilate in some ways, but just more or less integrate into the society that they come from. And as we began last week by looking at her appendices, you know, the suggestions for cultural brokers and the U.S. Declaration for, or the U.N.'s Declaration for Human Rights, this was a precursor towards understanding what it is that, that she wants us to, to comprehend from this book. And largely, especially in this first half, which you'll get through by the end of this week, we're beginning to understand that she wants to educate, number one, her readers about refugees in their backyard, especially for people who happen to live in Lincoln, Nebraska, but also to, to sort of remind us that these calls for um, universal human rights that have been put into these these very ample and detailed definitions have been largely, well, not largely, but to a, a great extent, uh, ignored, misapplied, or simply uh, just remain in an oblivious part of our of our understanding. So she brings this this book uh, as as an educational awakening uh, towards community, right? And one of the things that, that also seems to come up here, and this is a mantra that's really developed in, in, in uh, regards to thinking about the world as it's changing, is uh, by many activists, many social activists, cultural activists, uh, 
etc., uh, will use the, the phrase, uh, think globally, act locally. And you can see that Pfeiffer begins to, to uh, try to look at the world and look at the, the, the issues uh, that have developed in all of these refugees' homelands, and she connects that to the world in which she meets them. She encounters them in these small apartments, in the poor parts of town, in their struggles with money and with culture shock and in terms of uh, combating commercialism and uh, just sort of uh, dealing with the everyday obstacles in front of them. You know, these are obviously meant to, to sort of illuminate and illustrate the ongoing situation for the rest of us, but to, to these refugees who she encounters, and she literally goes out to them into their homes and helps them with this, she is uh, simply documenting their lives, right? And what's interesting is that she, she chooses stories actual stories from these people that help to show small successes at times, but more often than not, you know, illustrate these ideas of these are things that we as privileged uh, um, community members take for granted and ignore sometimes these situations. So I'll get into that a little bit more, but I want to tell you more about who Mary Piper is. She's, as I said, she's a Lincoln, Nebraska-based clinical psychologist, and she's been uh, uh, a very prominent community uh, organizer and activist in in uh, several different sort of cultural arenas for a long time here in, in the Midwest and in Lincoln, Nebraska. She received a degree in clinical psychology, a PhD back in 1977 from the University of Nebraska. And since that time, she's authored nine different books. And uh, if there's a theme that connects them all in some ways, she, she has used her clinical psychology background and knowledge to, to write about how American culture influences the health, the makeup of its people. And in this particular book, she's looking at, at the, the refugee as American people as well. Uh, one of her more famous books uh, that she wrote back in the 90s was called Reviving Ophelia. Some of you may know this and may have read it at some point. This was on the New York Times bestseller list for 26 weeks in 1994. And she was looking in this particular uh, book at the effects of societal pressures on uh, adolescent girls. Some of her own uh, particular experiences uh, inform this book, just like they do in the particular book that we read. Uh, she explores mental health of people, but she, you know, also begins to to sort of extrapolate the the definition of what is mental health, right? You'll notice, especially early on in some of these stories, the stories of the sisters, right, and their their mother. The mother she begins to focus on as living in this sort of um, limbo between here and there, and 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 constantly. Uh, recognizes the mother's sorrow. She, she comments routinely on how emotionally withdrawn she is, even as her daughters are, are striving to deal with school and, and you know buying a car and getting the right groceries and dealing with men and all these things. And, and yet there's still this sort of um, ambiguity about the mother's place. And this is certainly a mental health issue that, that Pfeiffer is, is highlighting that she's saying is not typically something that, that gets addressed. Uh, so the book itself was published in 2002, and the foreword makes a large acknowledgement to the events of uh, September 11, 2001. And it's appropriate. This, this book, as Pfeiffer's finishing it up and as it's coming out to press and being published, Pfeiffer says that she's hit. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. She's hit by this this hugely monumental global event that happens in the United States that helps sort of reframe and redirect our attention towards 
different peoples, different uh, cultures throughout the world and what it means for them to interact. And of course, we know that um, prior to this, this, this was an issue um, in terms of how we live as Americans, as individuals, as, as community members. We define ourselves by, by who uh, we are not a lot of times, who the outsiders are. Um, America has a history of nativism and xenophobia, um, and other countries do as well, uh, and other peoples and other cultures. Uh, the September 11th events so really strengthen this this uh, obstacle in terms of defining uh, in and out groups who we are and who we are not. And if you remember, and I I don't think Pfeiffer so much brings this up as as alludes to the time uh, of of the events afterwards. But if you remember, one of the things that came out of the Bush presidency in response to this. Uh, event and uh, forgive me, I don't remember if it was Bush himself or Rumsfeld or somebody who makes uh, very clear in in trying to to sort of define America's mission going forward. Uh, quote: If you are not with us, you are against us. And we work uh, for some time in this this um, absolute definition of who we are and who we are not. And Pfeiffer's book. Uh, you know, looking at outsiders, looking at people who are different than us, and people who 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 have an access to uh, human rights as laid out by the UN Declaration for Human Rights, but aren't oftentimes given those full-on rights. And if they are, you know, in the letter of the law, perhaps not in the spirit of the law. So her book enters into this conversation at a time when the United States is is not necessarily rethinking, but certainly redevoting parts of its thought process to uh, refugees, asylum seeker, seekers, you know, foreigners, immigrants, all of these people, right? And it, it sort of regenerates this, this nativist xenophobia that's always kind of bubbled uh, beneath the surface of the American uh, identity, even though we've always, you know, sort of prided ourselves on this home to all refugees, and even if we look back at the Emma Lazarus poem, uh, well known, written on the Statue of Liberty, you know, mother to all exiles, give me your tired, your poor, uh, yearning to be free, this is all part of that American uh, mythology of, of being here. And some of that mythology is created in, in, in this drive to, to uh, look at the immigration past, but we, we've oftentimes sort of bastardized that, that narrative and, and glorified it while also um, ignoring it and, and transforming it into something else. And this, you know, certainly if you're remembering the events of September 11th, really causes us to, to um, redirect our, our gaze at that. Uh, so the, the forward begins with mentioning this. And she goes from there. She, she introduces her book with that in mind. And then she begins with her prelude, which has, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but has her returning to that sort of myth of the American uh, people as being born or born or brought to being at Ellis Island, right? And we know, you know, just as an aside, that this is not the case for all immigrants to America. Sometimes we, we like to sort of shortcut our American narrative by, by precluding that, yes, we are a quote-unquote nation of immigrants, and Ellis Island provides the story for, for that, you know, sort of generalized narrative of how America came to be. You know, that's a myth, of course. We, we know that, that many of our immigrants came from other places, and we know that uh, the Native Americans who, who contribute to our, our culture come from elsewhere. And we know that, that, you know, immigration continues to proceed having nothing to do with an Ellis Island style uh, of immigration story. And so while we, we do look to this, and while Pfeiffer certainly brings this out as a touchstone, a bit romanticized, we, we have to understand that, that the immigration story is more, much more than just this, 
this mythologizing of the Ellis Island, you know, early 20th century, uh, hard on his luck, boy escapes to the New World and sees the Statue of Liberty and his eyes are gleaming, right? We, we know that, that, you know, even though she says America for dreamers, right, we know that this is in and of itself part of the mythos. And she gets into that, right? Uh, and she makes this one reference to a quote that says, um, uh, one immigrant who mentions that the streets were paved with gold was the, one of the mantras leading immigrants to the United States. And his, you know, realization is that the streets weren't paved, there was no gold, and when they were paved, I did most of the paving, something like that. I'm paraphrasing a bit. So it's this realization that that American dream, that welcoming to America, if I can make it there, uh, I'll be fine, is versed in a little bit of, uh, of uh, mythologizing. Um, from there, she goes on to begin talking about Lincoln itself as a sort of refugee center. And it's at this point where she sees the, the idea, uh, and back in the late 90s when she would have been writing this, Lincoln would have been one of the, the hot points for bringing uh, refugees from certain parts of the world, and determined by economy and city size and, and many other elements that, that helped to define why Lincoln was a good fit for bringing refugees. And over time, refugee uh, settling has taken different forms, but oftentimes what they've been working towards in, in more recent latter half of the 20th century and, and coming into the 21st century, more recent times is trying to resettle refugees in similar areas. There goes the dog. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. In similar areas where other people from their cultures and their homelands, etc., can support them. They didn't realize early on that this was a significant importance and slowly began to uh, and even as we we continue to recraft our refugee settling policies this is something that continues to come up um, so in this part of her book in this part of her study she defines the midwest and most of you uh, well, I shouldn't even say most of you, not knowing where mo uh, where all of you are from, but a lot of you who are from the Midwest, who are from Nebraska, who may be even from this eastern Nebraska uh, location, uh, she defines who that population is, that Nebraska population. And, of course, we know it's it's incredibly diverse, but uh, the, the refugee population diversifies that even more. And so entering into this community entering into this this particular place is you know a, a all at once it's a culture shock and it's a a way to sort of uh um how do i want to say determine what is quote unquote their first american experience and you hear in this part a, a couple of anecdotal references about you know not having a clue where Nebraska was on the map and not having any any idea of uh, where others have gone before them. And you hear about a family who moved first to, I believe it was Fargo, and then came down to Lincoln, and you know, many, many different stories. And, and Pfeiffer sort of implies that, you know, if this were you moving to, you know, a foreign country, what would your experience be? What would your um, first uh, initial response be? Etc. And so into this, Pfeiffer suggests the you know mandate, the requirement, the the suggestion that individuals who have the power, who have the privilege, who have the experience, reach out and interact with these these uh, refugees, the unfortunate, uh, misplaced, and displaced peoples who need our. Uh, if not expertise, then certainly our connectivity, right? And this idea that we can uh, be cultural brokers begins to surface at this time, right? And Pfeiffer herself has long existed in, in this area as a cultural broker. Now, let me just caution you here, uh, and, and you are all astute readers and, and are critical readers, 
And one of the things that might be of issue, and you may have picked up on this already, is that in this role as a cultural broker, there is the danger of carrying that privilege, that privileged American experience, to an extreme where we aren't necessarily uh, doing this wholeheartedly out of a, a, a beneficial or a co-beneficial relationship, but instead we create this powered relationship where we are the great savior to these displaced people in a way that, that maybe uh, disempowers them rather than gives them a power. And so this is a critical response that we might want to you know, delve into a little bit more. There are problems. And if you you know parse Pfeiffer's words, there might even be some times where she slips into that sort of privileged perspective. You might ask yourself that. You know, certainly these things are, are great possibilities and they might even be inevitable in, in continuing relationships like these. But I will give it to Piper that her intentions feel very much um, uh, positivist in terms of giving uh, help where, where she can best see her own particular uh, skills and connections and knowledge to have the most effect. You know, and she talks about, early on especially, she talks about being a cultural broker in very simple situations and in much more complicated ones, all the while sort of implying that people who don't have this help, she wonders what they would do. You know, if you did not have a friend, for instance, who is able to, you know, uh, break down the walls of the INS and, and find a phone number and repeatedly do these things, you know, there are many, many other stories of people who don't have, you know, uh, somebody doing these things for them. So she she's quick to, to suggest that a cultural broker can help, but also, uh, you know, with the connective message that there are many people out there who do not receive help like this or who can't find somebody willing to do this or simply drop through the cracks and their stories are, are uh, very sad ones at that. She moves through uh, this particular part and into the part of her writing where she looks more specifically long-term at some stories. She talks about the sisters and the way that, that um, they were ignored in school and how they are trying to, to sort of integrate themselves in each of their own roles and she does this wonderful description of, of how each of the sisters served a particular role in the family. And behind this is the, the important figure of their mother who is being sort of uh, effaced throughout. And that's a, a theme that returns at a couple other places in her writing. The effacement of these refugees who are supposed to be, and I'm right now speaking tongue-in-cheek as as maybe uh, a particular American dominant voice might say, they should be happy that they're here and that they're safe and that they're no longer in X, Y, or Z homeland facing X, Y, or Z problem. Well, we learn, and Piper seems to bring this up and maybe could hit this home a little bit, that that's not all that, that uh, these people are alive for. They have homes. They have you know, lives, they have other parts of themselves where they, they don't just say, yes, America, I'm here, thank God, everything is going to be all right. It's not that simple. Um, she, she really could do more to pour into that a little bit here early on. Uh, perhaps the, the, the quantity of the anecdotal evidence will, will build to that uh, in your reading if you pay attention to those things. So I want to ask, stop and ask you some questions to consider at this point in your reading. Um, Pfeiffer here, here brings up the idea of culture shock. She may not use those words, but we might sort of simplify it as being immersed in another culture that we'll, we're not familiar with. You know, she also seems to imply that as Americans, culture shock means something very different to us. And... And she's bringing up, though again, not using this word, she's bringing up our sense of privilege. We have uh, so much 
driving our perspectives that we often don't uh, recognize uh, that, that is expressed in our privilege and in our means of dealing with culture shock. She brings up an example where, uh, again, if we were immersed in another country, we would already have the knowledge to recognize that we're not capable of doing something so we can find somebody to do it for us. We have this sort of uh, American uh, privilege that allows us to do this. Okay, so I want you to ponder that. For Americans, for most Americans, what does culture shock mean? Okay, then I also want you to, to consider this myth that we've brought up and that Piper sort of pours through a little bit. Do we as Americans have a sense of our image or face to the rest of the world, right? And even when we ask that, do we think of all the parts of the world, right? We, we tend to sort of fall back on this idea that America means this, you know, number one, in America. But number two, how does it look or define itself to the rest of the world? How does the rest of the world see it? Is it that, that sort of glorified, if I can just get there, everything will be all right? You know, or is it something else? You know, are we the greatest nation on earth? You know, as we, we tend to sometimes, you know, define ourselves? Or are there, there other definers that other parts of the world see when they look at us? These are questions about privilege that I want us to consider. And then finally, this idea of ignorance, okay? Where does a person's fear of difference register on our list of things we do subconsciously? And in this, this section, she looks at uh, the sisters and their assimilation issues and this idea of being feared for their outsiderness. You know, do we do this uh, in a subconscious level? We have, and again, Pfeiffer is a, a clinical psychologist by, by background, we have a, a psychological default to define people, things, places, uh, bits of knowledge by in and out group. What things are in and what things can we classify as knowns and what things are out. What things can we, you know, not necessarily fear but not understand and not welcome and not be attracted to because they, they represent difference from us. Okay. She goes on from here in the in the, the following two chapters. She she again looks at some anecdotal uh, stories that help illuminate this idea of difference and being brought to a culture that is not their own and having to 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 learn it. And in fact in, in this section there is a, a wonderful list. Uh, it's I believe it's on pages ninety through ninety four of what she has done you know, idiosyncratic things she has done for cultural brokers. And, and many of these things boil down to what's oftentimes called institutional literacy or knowing the language, the communication patterns, the, the systems of doing things within an institution, right? How does one get a driver's license? How does one uh, register to vote? You know, how do you navigate a grocery store? All of these things are small institutions that we take for granted. But as a cultural broker, she has had to to uh, serve as a translator, a, a media in, in in helping refugees understand these things. And uh, if you you know you add up all of those idiosyncratic you know differences along with the trauma. Uh, the literal trauma, certainly, of, of what it is that has driven them from their homeland, as well as the journey and the waiting and the money and the stress and all of these things, we can begin to understand why mental health would be something that Pfeiffer is gradually beginning to, to look at in, in terms of uh, how these people are doing here in the United States and in the Midwest. Okay. Um, I want to just stop there and leave you with those, those sort of questions as you go forward into the second half of the book. Um, you have some really compelling issues that come out in, this, uh, in these couple of chapters here towards the end. She talks about um, immigrants being largely uh, able to succeed uh, by the second 
generation or towards the end of the second generation. And if they don't, you know, sometimes that spells trouble for the ensuing generations after that. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that. Uh, it also has to do with the way that, that we receive them, the receiving nations as well. And so by the end of this section, she begins to, uh, to help us understand what our uh, role is in, in welcoming outsiders and, and you know, to recognize, again, as I said in, in the, the Declaration of Human Rights reading from last week, that we are all humans and that we're all entitled to these basic human rights. Um, I want you, as you read forward and as you begin to do do your writing assignment, to look at uh, some of the things that she mentions during this time, right? She says, you know, for one thing, I always find this very, very interesting. Um, the best minds of our time, she says, are writing ad copy. This is her way of sort of shortcutting the idea that the America that outsiders see is built on so many different uh, you know, advertising campaigns or commercialization. So uh, the genuineness of, of, of uh, experience is being sort of whitewashed by, you know, what does she bring out at the, at the, the dinners, Coca-Cola and prepackaged snacks and fatty foods, all of these things that speak to them as American. And, and you know, it's a, it's a small way to define uh, the the nature of their of their uh, experience, and then lastly, I want you to look at um, the idea that um, children as translators or uh, ill trained, ill adapted translators might harm uh, the refugee and their families more than help them. And we look at this as, as sort of a, I'm not sure how we look at it exactly, but we, we tend to sort of sometimes fall back on the fact that it's a necessary uh, failure. But it, it, it can be remedied. And I think she begins men's to get at this. And she ends this section by, by even confessing at one point that, you know, this, I think it's the INS example that she's talking about. It's a mess for her to navigate, and she's she's native, she's very highly educated, and she's got connections in time and all of these resources, and for her, this is still a mess to navigate. So what about outsiders, you know, including children that might have to be the speakers for the family in this situation? What are all those things uh, like? You know, how do we represent this sort of safety net, but yet still... Uh, this closed door in so many ways. So consider all of those things as you finish your reading for the week and as you get ready to do your writing assignment. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, please send me an email. I may do a little bit of an update video as I go along. Uh, I will, of course, let you know in an alert um, uh, by email and by an announcement on Blackboard. Uh, if there's any questions, as I said, just get in touch with me. Thank you very much.